All right, well, I guess we might as well get this thing started. And uh, I was told this was going to be a Q&A, and so I want to answer your questions. Your questions are much more important than anything I have to say. And well, tell me what the most useful thing I can do here is. Um, but over the last couple of days, uh, I actually have asked a fair number of times, usually on the internet, because tragically, 4chan at one point published my email address. Uh, uh, why are you going to be a gamer next? Right? Because I am I am yes. cisgender heterosexual white male. I am as close as society means short default human, right? And people kept asking me this question. And it bothered me. Um, because I don't think of this as an exclusive space, right? This is a safe space. But it's supposed to be an inclusive space. And before we start about anything else. I just wanted to express to you how much I appreciate the fact that you guys have all come down to this and that this exists, right? And that all the volunteers, all of you guys make this possible because to me, uh, when I first started playing games, right, I remember being at the local comic shop and we would be sitting around that table, right, and you had everybody, right? It didn't matter gender or race, right? Yeah an old guy, we had a kid who was in a wheelchair, it all, and the reason was, the thing that was great about games is that if you didn't fit in somewhere else, there was a seat at the table for you with games, right? We often get this stereotype attached to us, this, this stigma of being these uh, cheetahs eating basement dwellers, right? <laughs> but you know why we get that stigma? The reason we get that stigma is because while that kid, because there are some right? But, while that kid was getting picked on in classroom, was told not to sit at the table with the other kids while he was getting bullied at recess. With games, yeah, we let that person. We said, "Hey, yeah, come, come play with us, right? In our world, you can be whoever you want to be. Do you want to be an elf wizard? Great. Do you want to experiment being a different gender? Go for it, right? These are these are the things that gaming allowed, the gaming expressed to us." when some other, few, some other few spaces did, right? Especially in high school, most of us went through it, right? Most of us had that moment in high school where uh, maybe we didn't fit perfectly in this ideal that society had established for us. And at that time, I mean, we found friends, we found bonds, we found a place of acceptance where other people wouldn't accept us in this community. And so, I just wanted to thank you guys all for coming to this because it worries me sometimes. Over the last few years, I've seen more and more of uh, a fear of our culture, a, a fear of new people being brought in. But to me, uh, what gaming is about is there always being an open seat at the table, no matter who you are. So, I just wanted to tell you guys, to express to you guys how much I appreciate the fact that this exists that you guys are all here supporting it, and how much this does matter. Uh, but with that, really what I want to do is answer all you guys' questions and hear all your thoughts, because I've heard myself talk plenty. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Shoot, anything? Yeah, go. Hi, I was wondering your opinion on um, the increasing kind of feminist movement in the video games. Uh, there's a, a bunch of different extremists and you know different examples. I myself am not a fan of Brandy Scorsese. Um, but she's just one example. Um, where do you feel that the feminist movement is going as far as influencing I am, I am an ardent egalitarian. Uh, this, is, this is one of my core life beliefs, right? And to me, there is, I will fight for equality for anyone when clear demonstrable inequalities exist, right? And it doesn't matter race, gender, sexuality, what issue it is. And in games, as in society in general, right, there are uh, clear, clear gender lines drawn. And right now, there is, I mean, as much as I love a lot of what Ubisoft does, the fact that it didn't even register to make a playable female character, right, is one of those moments where, right, you guys all heard about oh, that. Oh, they registered, but I got nothing. Right. Like, you guys all heard about that tournament in uh, Finland run by the group. The hardest males only tournament, yeah. right? And their ex their explicit reason was that it wouldn't do to have 
women beat men. I mean, I know I'm, I'm a little bit hyperbole there, but really it was the fact that this was a qualifier tournament for another males-only tournament, and they were like, what would we do if a woman, woman won? She would then qualify for the other male-only tournament. We couldn't have that. So I think there are clear, uh, there are still clear inequalities in our system. I think there's a place for lots of different ways of fighting that inequality. For me personally, I, I believe in, in dialogue and rational discussion and that I, I do believe that uh, the arc of history bends towards justice, right? Uh, I do believe that as a whole, as a species, every day, we may not see it because of the variations, right? But things are better today than they were 20 years ago, better than 50 years ago, way better than 100 years ago, right? In this country, you go back 200 years and we have slavery. This is, so we are making progress, and so I believe in that form of rational discussion. But uh, on the other hand, I actually do think people like Anita Sarkeesian have a place. I think that uh, there is, I may not agree with all of the methods, but there's this moment where you need bombast, where you need someone to kick everyone in the face, right, to get people to this. I hope that we are now getting past that moment. Right, past where we need the wake-up call. Uh, but as far as this idea of feminism in games, I think there are no ideas that shouldn't be explored in games. And so I think there's, there's a place to explore all of these concepts. I, I, hope, I hope that we can do it by bringing us together, though, rather than just dividing us on the gender lines. Because my biggest concern is that there'll be some sort of almost affirmative action sort of quota that companies will have to have, where they'll have to have a certain amount of female characters, even where it may not apply or fit appropriately. And they'll just throw a female character in because they have to, not because it fits the story. So I, I've heard that argument a great deal, right? And truth be told, as, as this egalitarian view, right, I feel like in games, most games, 90% of the time, uh, we're dealing with an environment where the representation I want to see, let's just make it uh, equal to society, right? 53% of characters, I feel like, it's totally reasonable to have as female characters. It is completely reasonable to have at least 10% of your characters be, uh, be either gay or bisexual or any of these things, right? Like, uh, if you look at games made in the US, the amount that we underrepresent uh, Latinos and African Americans, yeah. right, is, is unbelievable. And the truth about this is that it's very rare. How many good stories do you know? How many good stories, books, things, like, how many good films do you know that don't have female characters, right? At the relation between, uh, well, Lord of the Rings even has several, though, yeah. right? And I mean, we have we have an elf queen, right, who is who's ruling society who actually does a great deal to help the quest for it, right? And granted, I will also say that uh, the your main adventuring party, right, in Lord of the Rings, I'll totally grant you doesn't have uh, female characters. But uh, then we look at a thousand other fantasy novels, right? I think that it's very difficult. I mean even going back, right, uh, the Odyssey, right, we have a ton of female characters we encounter. There's, there's an interplay between the gender, which, genders which I think will make our work richer. And I think it's very hard to have a few examples. And for that matter, The Hobbit, there's zero reason that any of those characters could, would, it would not have had a substantive impact on the storyline, in my opinion, to if any of those characters had been female. Um, so I think the difficulty is, it's hard to sell me on many game narratives. Like very often I get, but what about our first person shooters, right? Uh, US Armed Forces is close to a third female. It's, it's not a place where, and it's one of these things where it, it is not impossible for us to make narratives that can have substantive female characters, and it's not impossible for us to uh, represent as society represents. I'm not asking for more than that, but I, I don't want to see quotas in games. There may be places where this is not necessary, but as a whole, as a survey of our industry, I do feel like we should be doing it. 
better than we are. Uh, but other questions and thoughts? It's just, a thought. yeah. it's just like women make up, or at least females make up half of the population of the world. Yeah. So I don't understand where there would be a place that women wouldn't be included at all. Like, what kind of context would you see zero women? Unless the storyline was like male only prison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, are people, there are female guards. There are female guards. People that could work up. People that work up front. The nurse, you know. Right. I mean, the nurse could be male too, but there's lots of places where females can be inside of a game that. Even in first-person shooters, why we could we could definitely have. There are now women on the front lines and. Yeah. Definitely have women in first person shooters. And so I mean, I think that I think you're right. I think that there's there are very few places. Right? The, the most exclusive place that I can name still have that opportunity. I, I think that we as as writers and developers can do more. I I have yet to encounter a story that I feel like excludes a a viable female role, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in most of the cases where I hear that argument, it's because we are perpetuating a bias towards specific gender occupations, right? Um, we used to hear this argument in superhero comics, right? About how, how. Women were men, violent. Right. Yeah. Men are the superheroes, right? Women are, women are the love interest. Right. Right. And that's still a problem in movies today. So many of the superhero movies focus on male superheroes. Granted, there are more of them, but you know, there's still a good proportion of female superheroes that are just tragic or doing that. And I mean, I think I think we'll slowly come to find a place for all. But I don't want us to have to radically change our art, but I don't think we have to. I think we just have to be more conscientious. Uh, but other questions, other thoughts. Yeah, go. Um, what kind of in games? Um, we talk a lot about how different ways we can use games. That games can be used in not just for, not just only for fun, but in different areas of life. And what's something like you're really, What are a couple of things you're really passionate about in the gaming industry? Oh, in terms of uh, things to explore. Yeah. So, I'm actually really passionate about exploring more emotions, a further range of emotions than uh, what have investigated so far, right? All of us have our struggles. I have had plenty of, I've had to wrestle plenty of times with, with sorrow and depression and those sort of things. I've, I mean, we've all had experiences that go outside of the adrenaline high, right? And that's what I want to see. I want to see the cathartic game. That's really what I want to see. I want to see the game that much of the way that a song of literature can can express the things that I need I need to see expressed in order to to heal, right? I think we can do that. I think we can do that even better with games. We're starting to see. You must have liked brothers. I, well, there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, brothers is a really good one. We're starting to see it on a lot of vectors. I mean, I thought that Dragon Cancer was just wow. That was that was very rough. What was this uh, that dragon oh, cancer. Yeah. I have that right, right? Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I want to see. I want to see games where we start exploring other avenues of engagement other than just action. And I love, right? I love action games. I when you first person to tell you, like, I played plenty of them. I got my start on the Call of Duty series, right? That was my first really big uh, AAA game I worked on, and. So I think that we shouldn't get rid of them, right? Just like the summer blockbuster. I love summer blockbusters. I just don't want an industry where all we make is summer blockbusters. But yeah, other questions. Yeah, go. In that vein, what are your thoughts on games as tools? I know education gets thrown around a lot, but more recently there was an iOS game to help crunch cancer data, and there was another one I believe a little while back for protein folding. Folding was fantastic, right? It came to uh, Conclusion had discovered things that we hadn't discovered, uh, and I think games are a great source for this, right? Uh, I pace a lot while I talk, so I have to forgive me. I really want to be on the panel with you guys and like, just sit and hang out, but I have too much of a nervous disposition to stand still. Um, so, uh, for all you guys, you guys, do you guys know the basic premise behind folding? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I think we can do. I've seen a lot of things, right? I just saw a game about malaria where 
fundamentally tens of thousands of lives are lost every year because we have all of these blood samples that we don't have anybody trained to, to test for malaria. Because the only people who get that training are doctors and nurses, right? people who have years. But it's actually a really simple test. It's something that anybody can do. Like it takes like 20 minutes to train somebody up. And so by putting it in this game context, we train everybody up, and then you get to go through so many more views. And anyone that are flagged yes by enough people, they probably go get checked out by a real doctor. Um, but it at least allows us to sort through all the obvious no's, red flag things for the actual experts. Uh, I think that's super important. And education, we're seeing it all the time. I really do believe in a future where our school system is made, made more engaging through, through the use of play. Right? To me, I'm sure I've said this in the next class at some point, but the most natural way to learn is through play. Right? You watch young children, how do they learn through play? You watch animals out on the savanna, right, wrestling with each other. We learn through play. It's only in the last 150 years, right? It's only since the Prussians implemented this uh, militarized school system. And I mean, theirs actually was militarized. I, uh, so right, I've definitely heard this story before, but literally their school system was taught by, uh, they didn't have enough money to pay for pensions for their soldiers, so they gave them the nice municipal jobs as a reward for getting through the army. Uh, and so their school system was actually designed to train, be taught by drill sergeants, and that is the school system we have inherited. Uh, and in a lot of ways it was great, right? But it was great for that era. As we move to, towards a new era, we now have the capacity to return to a more natural state of learning, uh, and learning through play. And so I do think that there's lots of, lots of this sort of thing, and oh, is it double fine? Who's making the, uh, this is, tells you, early morning, early morning. Uh, who's making the game that's like Code Hero? Um, that's not double fine. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's uh, Hack and Slash. Hack and Slash, that's yeah. what I was looking for. Thank you, awesome. A uh, Hack and Slash is a game to teach coding through manipulating the world through code, right? So there, I think there's a lot of applications. I'm really looking forward to a future where. Do you know the name of the if you type in malaria game, I believe you will not fall. You will not be lost in the steam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mine was just a, a question kind of yeah. side. Uh, is there ever a chance that you guys would bundle in DVD and sell? Because like, I, I know an extra credit is some more kids can oh, nice. design a, a game using, I forget which one I had list, and they use the other ones. But uh, I make them watch a couple of the episodes at least. That way they're getting some designer background. Cool. And then they, they make, usually it's like Flappy Bird ripoffs, but, <laughs> but they're, they're getting that practice. But it, the site itself has kind of become an unbearable mess. To like, like, I'll be like, I know there was this really good episode. The so YouTube, YouTube channel. Season three. Categorize it on YouTube channels. I have yeah. yeah. OK, because yeah. I used to go to this site and then. Yeah, no, it. Yeah. to fix that site. <laughs> <laughs> it is unfortunate that. YouTube gives us a lot more tools that are just at hand to sort of organize things. So if you check out the YouTube channel, I think you'll be able to better find what you're looking for. But do you want to feel that one? Um, sure. So on the YouTube channel, we've created a bunch of playlists. There's uh, they're sorted under like game design, game narrative, stuff about getting a career in the industry, and they're sorted also by show. So you can find like the new design club and James or Pence and all that is sorted out. And is that all new since you guys left the uh, old PA? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. so we've grown into our wings. Yeah. Also, um, write down any suggestions for like, actually, everyone. Um, write down suggestions. I am going to be rebuilding the website. Um, Iko is our web designer, by the yes. way, for context. Iko is the web designer, and I am the person yeah. at the end of the episodes. It's like, if you need to do something with extra credits, contact Soraya. That's the the experts do not run Patty. Um, so yeah, um, I'm sure a lovely sprite is going to go and get us some scratch paper. They're sending um, us on Let me see if there any other way. So, the sweet thing about panels is usually come with these. Here, if you want any suggestions you have, anything that would be helpful, especially for classroom settings, feel free to write down and just like pass it around, hand it to them at the end. Um, and it, for any of you guys, we would love to know things that you'd like to see on the show that you'd like to uh, 
uh, that you'd like to see in terms of making it more useful for you guys, or especially if you're showing your classes, how it can be more accessible. Uh, that's something we're always working on. But uh, other questions? I thought, yeah. Uh, earlier on, you were talking about you know uh, games like people role play as other genders and sexualities, and I was just wondering if uh, this is a question I actually had for our panel yesterday: Is customization really worth it? Because Christine Love, like mentioned, like uh, like having games uh, be more about experiences rather than the identities, and with you know it's not practical. I mean, you can try, but for a game that lets you customize gender, sexuality, able-bodiedness, like uh, race a whole bunch of other things. It's impossible to create like a story that is, I guess, tailored to each and every one of those uh, different combinations. I mean, like, in an ideal world, none of these would change anything. Cause, and like, that's, I guess that's the, the great beauty of uh, uh, role-playing a different gender in an ideal world where you know, that doesn't affect the story at all. But then again, there are like, games like you know, Gone Home, Dysphoria, where these are, and uh, well, The Walking Dead, these are games that are you know, specifically tailored to this one character that's in a minority. So for Lee in The Walking Dead, he gets all these racial microaggressions. For Gone Home, uh, Sam's fans are assholes. Uh, <laughs> and and if you're dealing specifically with those topics, uh, the, the principle, I, I don't want to say, I mean, as we brought up earlier, I don't want to say change the art because you're, uh, because you feel like you have to make 100% of all of our products 100% inclusive, right? It's that like there's so many games where your protagonist, where those things are not relevant, right? Mass Effect is a super heavy narrative heavy game, right? They could have left 99% of it the same. Right? I mean, they did, they did actually make changes for the genders, but if you could romance the same character regardless of what gender you were, and you know something? Most of the romance lines could stay the same, right? We don't actually, we aren't that different. Um, and so, uh, I think that if you're specifically dealing with issues around sexuality, race, all those sort of things, you are constrained. I don't want to say that I feel like every game has to include everyone in every role, right? I just think there's a lot more to do. But you had a follow up, right? Oh, yeah, yeah but that's a really great, a uh, lot more context for this. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, this is, I guess, kind of thing, yeah, but the loaded question was: Was customization is customization worth it? And I, I, well, I guess the real question is like, um, as a game developer, or um, do you think we should be doing more of those kinds of? Because like uh, the Walking Dead like, is not about Lee being black, and it's not about uh, the other characters about being in other minorities. But it's you know something that really does like flavor the entire narrative and makes these characters much richer. So should we, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, yeah, more of yeah, these uh, stories that really have a very specific character in mind for a narrative, or like which would be better for like generating empathy and, or I guess like helping, you know, social issues, uh, characters that have very specific stories or games that let you customize the character, uh, however. So I mean I think it's based on the game you're playing, you're creating, right? Uh, there are a lot of games in which we don't have to do anything additional other than some model swapping in order to create to allow people to play a character that they relate to. Right? In terms of games where you do have a very narrow specific focus story where it requires character to be of a certain gender or sexuality or race, then, I mean, I see no problem with with exploring how you need to explore, right? I don't think that, again, every game has to in any way feature everyone. I just think that there's a lot of games that easily could that we, we miss out on. Uh, and so, uh, is it worth it? I think there's a lot of simpler ways, like as a developer, right? We're making all these models anyway. We're making all these skins anyway. There's so many games where you could just randomly roll, right? And say, any character in the game will be a random one of these, right? Uh, so the uh, the Garrus or whatever that you see versus the one that I see may be totally different, right? Uh, because all we did was take a random check on a table and 
uh, use that to, I mean, most of these games, especially games where you ever have a character creation screen, well, that's just a bunch of variables, right? There's no reason that those have to be fixed for any character in the game, uh, for, for a lot of stories. So it's just a way to think about uh, how, we can, how we can explore this further without necessarily yeah. Take away from you. I think there are plenty of cases like Gone Home where you need that type of character. In the cases where you don't, which is so many characters, so many games, so many games around me embodying the character rather than me observing the character, right? In games where I'm observing the character, the character has to be fixed because it is it should be relevant to the narrative, and if it's not, you have failed at creating your narrative properly, right? For a game where you're observing the character. In the game where I am being the character, there are relatively cheap ways that we can we can make it work. Or we can make the character anyone who I may be, I have it be reflective of me or of the person whose shoes I want to step in. Right. But other questions? Yes. Then um, would you say that like the Gordon Freeman approach or the Master Chief approach is like doing it wrong? Because it's a fixed character, but it's designed. You know, to like be all nearly voiceless, to be able to even inject yourself into it without actually including any real customization. So it's really interesting, right? They're they're actually slightly different because Master Chief. I don't think we actually have any. I don't think Master Chief is ever gendered within the game. I have to think through it. You know, they have a voice, and that's it. Right. Uh, through through whatever voice box thing. <laughs> uh, but I think that in a lot of those. Faces protagonists, they can be whoever you want, right? There's a lot of empty Tesla characters. Gordon Freeman is a really interesting one because that character has evolved over the series, right? And has ended up taking on a more specific characterization rather than, even though they don't speak, there is a person who is Gordon Freeman within that narrative, right? But yeah, well, it. It's interesting because Shell doesn't really, you create, I feel like you create a lot more of the person who Shell is, right? Do you, how long do you take to throw the companion cube in there, right? Uh, Gordon Freeman has a lot more sort of scripted interactions with people, right? Uh, or, or at least moments. He's told him he is right. a lot more often by a reliable character as opposed to GLaDOS. <laughs> right, right. And that's, that's really, this is excellent. This is why I love these discussions. No, that's exactly what it is to me, right? Uh, and so that's why Gordon is, is a little bit of a weird case. And then questions like, like Mario, right? If in a Mario game, I could select to be Princess Peach, would it affect me, would it affect the game, right? Especially if they were Well, clearly, right? <laughs> I'm still disappointed that we don't have Toad back in the as it, two is far far away the best. Uh, although two wasn't actually a Mario game. It was, it was rescripted yep. to a different game. Brilliant. Uh, all right. Other questions? Yeah. So I like what you're saying at the beginning about how games can be very inclusive and how we can have a seat at the table. But at the same time, um, going online, there's like the big stereotype that there's a lot of like vitriol, of, like hateful people who are like constantly like being very hateful online. And so I was wondering, we see a lot of that on the internet in general too. I was wondering if you think that there's anything about gaming that exacerbates this, and if you think there's anything that we can do either as developers, as players, or as players to better the situation. So yes, and far too early in the morning <laughs> to kind of go through this, but I'm gonna try. Uh, so first off, as far as games go to exacerbate this. So A, starting at the beginning, internet. I don't think we as a species were, we are, we are not evolutionarily prepared to have a megaphone where at any moment I can speak to a billion people, right? <laughs> we do not, we are not ready for that. And then we've, we've got a thrust upon us, right? I, anyone can have a voice to everywhere, which is fantastic. But just like with society, right? It took us tens of thousands of years to create our social contract, right? Hopefully we do it in a faster time to create our online social contract to start coming up with a, a set of etiquette and behavior which, is, which forms a decent society online. We're not there yet, obviously. Um, but games, then you have this problem where you take that anonymity, you take all these things, you take this megaphone that everyone has, uh, you take this ability to 
consequence we hurt people, right? And now you put it in a competitive environment. It happens more with competitive games than with any other type of games. You see it substantially less on cooperative Minecraft servers or uh, SimCity Root. <laughs> Go on, Minecraft. Go on. But yeah, there's, and there's still, and unfortunately, there are, there are people who have come to, to learn from the Yu-Gi-Oh! Troll, some of those, uh, some of those Minecraft servers. There's an unfortunate number of YouTube videos of people joking specifically to, to wreck out of people's days. But, uh, but usually it's this fact that you put us in a competitive environment. If we're succeeding in a competitive environment, we feel good about ourselves, and there's very rarely any reason to put other people out. If we are failing in a competitive environment, we have this moment, many of us, where subconsciously, as a self-defense mechanism, rather than admit our own failure, we instead look to other things to blame. And there's, in games, very often the easiest thing to blame is the other people around you, right? Uh, it's very easy to start taking other people out, and then that becomes a set pattern of behavior, right? You have you have people who sort of go into games that way, so that way preemptively they don't have to feel bad about the fact that they lost because they're trash talking everybody else, right? They they preemptively set it up in their mind that everybody else is trash, uh, and so I think it's a defensive reflex. I think that there's some ways to mitigate this. Having escape valves within competitive games for some of that blame is great. Uh, it's still bad in games like Magic the Gathering or games like uh, Call of Duty. It's not quite as bad, though, as in League of Legends. And you think, comparing League of Legends to Call of Duty, part of me Part of me wants to, the elitist part of me wants to say that there's, there's potentially more thinking required for a game of League of Legends, therefore I would expect the audience to be of a higher caliber, and yet substantially worse. And I think the reason is that in games like Magic, you can blame bad shuffle. Right? Rather than just saying someone else is terrible, or even someone on your team, if you're playing a team game of Magic, playing two-headed giant, whatever is terrible, you can blame a bad draw. That's the scheme. That's another. Yeah. Well, and if you're not blaming the other people, you're blaming the system itself, the and, mechanics, or. And it's much better to blame the system, right? Like, <laughs> so, one of the side effects, there's lots of reasons we put the noob tube in Call of Duty, right? But one of the side effects of it is really positive is that people would blame the system, right? People would be like, ah, oh, this thing's so broken, this thing is so terrible, like, I'm a much better player than that person, they still kill me with the stupid noob tube. It's fine, right? Go blame the, go blame me as a designer all day. Go nuts, because you're not taking away from everything else. Uh, when, it's it's funny because you have less, much less trash talk there to the people who, to your opposing team, than, than you sometimes do on your own team where you, you when you're when you're eating that failure state. So, I think escape valves are one of the answers. I think we have to do a lot more systemically though as well to allow for easier things like, A, I mean, reporting systems in most of these games are difficult, they're totally obscure, you usually don't get any response of whether or not your report ever mattered. B, we need stuff like positive reinforcement. There's a lot of ways that we can reinforce good behavior rather than just punish bad behavior. Well, there's a lot of them that are starting to. We're finally getting this point. Okay, it's like, it's like, it's another mobile like Dawn Legends, and uh, one of the things I always really want to experiment with, which I haven't gotten to play around with yet, but if I ever, if I ever got to, I think there's some system where you have people sign up, and you have to have a perfect record or whatever, a very high, like, you're not an evil person score, and then you can opt in for one or two or three games a day where, let's say it's a legend, right? Four of you are, or maybe even nine people, are people with very positive scores. And rather than throw the one person with who, who has been acting out, who's been acting very poorly, rather than throw them into prisoners, island, rather than throw them with a bunch of other bad people who are going to reinforce that behavior, right, and normalize that behavior, 
let some of us take the bullet, right? And play every once in a while, play one game with somebody who just one person on teams. Because as soon as you surround that person with, with good people, with people who are first game, they're gonna rage, right? First game they're gonna try and hurt every other. After it's not after it's not doing anything two or three games, after the society that they exist within is of a higher level, I think you do graduate from that, right? And I think that this is this is one of the things we should be looking towards, right? It's weird, we exist in a society which thinks that laws are to protect us from the bad. If you look to a lot of old cultures, they also view laws as a way to improve, improve human beings, right? And, and just make us all better, right? Uh, and that's, I think, what we're doing. So that was a very, very roundabout way, but I hope that was at least somewhat informative. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions, thoughts? Yeah, go. So, a little dev devil's advocate kind of question, but do you think it's even responsible for like AAA companies to even try to address, you know, I was like, oh, I want new characters, I want transgender characters, but they have to make money. Mm -hmm. And at that price tag, would you think it would be more of a leave it to the indie kind of guys? Because if you're not making stock, you know, or getting that X amount of games, you're going to fail and tank. So this, I love this argument because I hear this argument a lot. A, uh, the price is actually not, like, the Ubisoft thing was ridiculous, right? There's <laughs> one guy who wanted to work. Like, everybody, I mean, even their old, the uh, ex-director of animation there, who I think was now working at Naughty Dog, was like, are you kidding me? Like, unless things have gone way sideways since I was working there, this is like maybe three thousand dollars. But more importantly, as game budgets grow and grow, we have this issue. The traditional, the core audience for games, the, the young white male gamer, right? That audience can't pay for a seventy million dollar game. There are just not enough of that audience to be able to afford the ballooning budgets. So we have to find a greater audience. We, we need to start including these other people because otherwise we, we have gotten ourselves into this tech and graphics war that has escalated to the point where games can no longer fund themselves. That's why we have students closing all the time, right? There's like maybe a, a half dozen games a year that really make money. We can't exist, we don't want our industry to exist in a place where only, we, we only have mega blockbusters which are made by four studios. Right? <laughs> well, and yeah, that's, I would like to see, I would like to see AAA continue, and in order to do so, I think we, we do, we have to bring in new audiences. And so to me, it actually makes economic sense to start trying to see if we can expand who we appeal to. Right. Or at least not actively say this is not a Other questions or thoughts? Yeah? Any other topics? Yes, there are. Oh, are we at five minutes or ten? Ten. Perfect. I will just say yes. Yes, there are. Uh, there's, there's a lot of Oh, so the question was, uh, I like the Punic War series. Are there other topics in history you would like to cover? Uh, there are many. I love history. I would love to address it more on the show. Uh, there's always a question of, those, those episodes are very, very expensive for us to make. They require a great deal more research time. I mean, truth be told to all of you guys, some of these shows, I mean, very often extra credits is about what I'm working on or what I'm trying to explain to a class that I'm teaching or something that's happening in my life. So I get half the extra credits research time to overlap with something else I'm working on. Tragically, history, not as much. Uh, and so, and those are longer episodes. And so they're just, so we have to figure that out. And there's also a lot of games that I'm, I'm so disappointed with the Ubisoft thing because like, <laughs> I, would, I would love to talk something about doing the French Revolution, right? But, uh, but yes, there are a lot of other, and hopefully, hopefully, 
So you would be interested in more of those sort of episodes? Yes. How many of you guys would be interested in more extra history type episodes? Just raise right, okay, good, good, good. Right, good. Good, that makes me uh, All right, awesome. I learned more from that episode than I think I learned in history in high school. So, <laughs> so <laughs> right, you know, for, for all of you guys, all it was was I took those episodes, right? And we were like, on a lark. You remember the episode on um, interest curve? Yes. So all I did was take interest curve. I like I read all the history of the Punic Wars. I thought it was really cool. And then it's like, okay, uh, let's see if I can apply some of the things I've learned about how to engage an audience I've learned from games to a, a top classroom topic, right? And I really think I'm convinced that even if we don't use games in the classroom, using all these things that we've learned from entertaining to teach could make it way more accessible than. All those times you've told me, here's, here's a bunch of numbers and book to memorize. Like, what kind of history is that? What kind of history is it where it doesn't tell you something about you today? What kind of history, like story, the word story is right in there. Uh, but yes, okay, great. We would love to see more of those. But yeah, sure, sure. Um, if there was a game that incorporated a lot of things that extra credits has been talking about, we're talking about education, Incorporating history and gaming in the classroom. Do you think, and that was an independent company, do you think extra credits would be interested in supporting something like that? Yeah, I mean, if there's, if there's ever. I would play extra credits to game. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Uh, I would actually love to make a game about game design. Like, I think that. <laughs> right, like, it would be so mad. There's some things. But it would be. I would love to do something like that. And recently, recently I thought, Papers, Please is still probably my game of the year because, like, are you not a fan? No, I love Papers, Please. No, okay, you're like, oh, yes. oh, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> good, good. Uh, since I think that there's totally things that one can say uh, to about it. Right? I think there's ways you can picture, but overall, that experience was so radically different and so powerful and so dealing with real world things on multiple different levels and allowed you so much choice in a way that wasn't on a dark side, light side box, right? And I was just like, ah. Oh. So, that, so that's one of the examples where I would love to, like, I would love to think through how we can work on something. But, uh, but yeah, other questions back there? Um, I have a question from another person who can't be here. Um, and sorry, if this is already written, but I'm no, no. What are the components that make a game fun, and how do you go about executing those effectively? Wow, fun. So, <laughs> 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 okay, so this is going to be a lot more fun than you probably text back. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to take notes. Uh, okay, so, what are the components that make a game fun, and how do you go about executing First off, I think we need to get beyond fun and start asking ourselves, to start thinking in terms of engagement, right? Uh, there's a lot of games where our engagement is through fun, but there are lots of other ways to engage, right? Uh, you've all heard me say it a million times, Schindler's List is not fun, but it's engaging. Uh, so once you get past that, there's, there is no magic book, right? If there was, we'd all be made up. We'd only play with games, right? That we all need great games that we have, and that's just not the case. I think that the most important thing really is a rigor in terms of being willing to carry out the problem. Like, as soon as you get out, none of our ideas spring fully formed from our heads, right? None of our ideas are good at our first pass, no matter how many years of experience you have. Uh, we, can get, we, can, we can get a little bit closer by having a lot of time. So number one is get out to real people as soon as you possibly can. As soon as you can get out of the test, as soon as you can get out of the People who are not you, not your family, not your friends who are invested in telling you it's good, right, uh, to try this thing out. And the sooner you can do that with this, right, the sooner you can go and observe people and not talk to them, not intervene when they're playing your game wrong, right, the better you'll do. Also, it's a question of scope, right? No matter if you show a personal project, you only have so many total hours to work on it. More games are not fun, right, they're not engaging because they're only a fraction of the actual vision for what this could have been. Right? They didn't get the time to really refine the it the way they needed to. So scoping small, finding what the finding what the core is, building that, and then figuring out what you can build on top of that is in my opinion a better approach for how to 
how to create a game to be engaging than trying to have some giant vision, right, and, and say, we can build this whole thing. Because it's going to change all throughout the path. As soon as it hits other people, you're going to change it radically. And at the same time, you're also going to continuously find new, exciting, great things that you could add to the game. You also have to realize that at some point, when you put those things aside, say those are for the sequel, and just let's focus on getting the things we've got in here good. So those, that would be my 101, right? Uh, but I know we've only got five minutes left, so we probably have time for two more questions. Other questions? Yes, back there. Um, going more on the like, kind of like Schindler's List type thing, like, do you think we can expect some sort of like triple A game that kind of has a scope of something like Spec Ops? It just engagements with, through something that is not fun. Yes, but that's optimistic. Uh, <laughs> so I think the AAA industry is going through a refactoring right now. We're doing a lot of rethinking. I don't think it will be the immediate future. Uh, I think that we've gotten close. Like a game even as big budget as Spec Ops, you would have never seen something like that get released a couple years back, right? And uh, Walking Dead, right? There's you wouldn't see a license of that caliber be treated with that level of respect as it is. Uh, so I think we're getting closer. I think that it is on to some of you guys, right? To the next generation of developers who are going to come into a lot of these companies, not with the old staid mindsets that we have. It's it's about fun. It's about it's for young kids, right? Games for kids. All this. You guys are going to have all that way behind you, looking way further forward. You guys will get to correct all the mistakes I made. It's great. Uh, and I think the next generation will actually uh, start to produce those. And I think we're seeing those people at entry level now. All right, we've got two minutes left. We've got time for one more question. Anybody? Last chance. All right. Oh, we got one more. Go for it. Do you need any guests on for an upcoming credits episode? <laughs> Matter of fact, we actually <laughs> might. Uh, do we have a piece of paper we get? Yeah, yeah. Piece of paper. Um, e actually, email the extra credits at Gmail. Extra credits with a Z. I hate it, but yeah, we all hate it. We all hate the Z. Um, but I email extra credits at gmail.com. Include the portfolio, and I put that in the list, and I send it to Dan. Yeah, okay. and then if Dan likes it, he will send back an art test. Uh, and the same process as any studio, right? Except for we pay a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, love. <laughs> and, uh, someday, someday we'll be able. To, we'll be, we pay with more than love, but not to the level I would love to for these for these episodes. It's, it's not a. It, it's a good gig for art, but I think art should get better gigs. Uh, so anyway, yes, we would absolutely love for any of you guys who are at all interested. Uh, we would love to hear art. We love to have guest artists. We need them all the time. Just mail extra credits at Gmail. You'll see it at the end of the episodes as well. Or you can mail us right after. Oh, it's 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 all right. Well, thank you guys all for coming down so early.